I think there are maybe a couple more. All right, good evening, everybody. How are you? Um, welcome, to, uh, welcome to Miami Business School. It's the last uh, uh, of these uh, occasions for 2018. Uh, we have a stellar lineup for uh, next year. Uh, but uh, I thought on the last uh, evening of our Distinguished Leaders series, uh, we should have something a little bit more uh, festive, uh, perhaps the opportunity to uh, sample the product. Um, and we couldn't really do that with the CEO of Kellogg's Corn Flakes at 7 p.m., uh, <laughs> much as I'm sure he would love the notion that uh, the uh, consumer would be eating uh, Kellogg's for uh, an evening meal. Uh, but we definitely can have uh, some uh, Boston beer product uh, for uh, our entertainment and pleasure after uh, Dave's concluded. So thank you all very much for coming. Just by way of introduction, Dave uh, graduated from Harvard Business School. He uh, spent 20 years of his career with uh, Pepsi in a whole variety of uh, roles. And uh, before joining Boston Beer Company, uh, was uh, the CEO of Pete's uh, Coffee. Uh, out in uh, San Francisco, and uh, he was in that role for uh, five years uh, before uh, Jim Cook, uh, the founder of Boston Beer, um, approached him with respect to uh, joining the company in the role of CEO, uh, having previously served on the board of Boston Beer Company uh, prior to taking the role. So, uh, Dave, without further ado, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> hey, good evening, everybody. Um, John, thanks very much. Thank you, everybody at MBS, for inviting me here. I'm very honored and uh, happy to be here. To close out the year, I'm happy for the year to end. I don't know about you guys, but I'm ready. It's been a long year. Um, so what I thought I would do is just kind of, I, I think I would have maybe 30 minutes of presentation. And then let's just open up and do q, q and is more interesting anyway. So I have some slides here. I'll go through the slides. You actually, feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions at all. Um, and what I, want, what I did is titled this um, creating, our, creating the Future, because I think it's a, it's a theme that we've used a lot of Boston beer lately, is really, we're in a very competitive market, I'll show you, um, it's very challenging. I think in order to be successful, you have to really kind of seize the reins and you have to be very purposeful about what you want to get done. And you've got to kind of set those objectives and go after them very, very aggressively. So what we've been talking about at Boston Beer, and this was like coming out of a meeting with the top, whatever, six or 700 people, mostly sales folks. Creating the future is sort of our theme, so I thought I would just continue that theme uh, uh, into today. So what I'll do, oh, I'll start with this quote uh, from Alan Kay, uh, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. He was, uh, he was the guy who invented the Apple Mouse at, uh, at Xerox uh, Palo Alto Research Center. Steve Jobs could have said the best way to invent the future is to steal it, because that's actually, that's what he did. He stole, um, then did a lot of other good things after that. But, uh, but Alan Kay was the guy, I love the quote, and it's sort of the inspiration for what we're trying to do. So I'll talk about three things. I'll talk about the beer business, you know, with a focus on craft beer. Um, where, where is Boston Beer's role in that, in that world? What are we doing? How are we, how are we uh, surviving? Actually, we're up year to date. We're up about um, 14, like as of our last earnings call. It's a public company now. I've got to be careful what I say. 14% uh, uh, revenue growth. Um, and the prior two years, we had dips. So t it also shows you that timing is everything. So I just walked in and met Miraculous, everything got better. Um, it had nothing to do with me, but I'm gonna ride that thing in, uh, it, into the future. Um, so then maybe some, some thoughts about leadership, some things I've learned along the way, and uh, then we'll open up to Q&A. So let's talk about beer. Beverage is a big business. Um, and you can look at like this, just look at the stack bar over there. Um, you can see you know, soft drinks are the biggest chunk, but they're declining, actually, as everybody knows. Bottled water's growing, coffee's growing, a great category. Alcoholic beverage is like $250 billion. Uh, business, so it's a big business, um, and it's growing about three or four percent. It's really been driven mostly lately by wine, wine and spirits versus beer. And I'll show you how show you how that plays out. And we talk about beer. We talk about beer pretty broadly because beer we produce beer, but anything that goes through our breweries, we do cider, we do hard sparkling water called Truly. We consider those beer products as well. Um, this is if you look at this uh, chart, it just shows you that the green. Line there is really is the beer uh, percent of total alcoholic beverage sales. So you can see, really since the early 2000s, beer has been declining as a percent of total, and spirits for the most, you know, wines up a little bit. Spirits have been up pretty dramatically. I think most people in this room who are under the age of 35 are probably drinking. You're drinking much differently than somebody who's 10 years older than you right now. We're seeing that play out 
I'll talk a little bit about some of those trends. Um, the good news about beer is that we're in the we're sort of in the in the super premium area. So anything that's craft that's selling for whatever you know sixteen dollars uh, for a twelve pack or more, that's super that's that's super premium, or in this case, we're calling it above premium. There's a lot there is growth there. So there's growth, and that's the segment that we play in is a good place to be. You don't want to be honestly where Anheuser Busch is or where Miller Coors is with the, with the lion's share of their products. You know, Miller Coors Bud is under attack, and I'll show you what that looks like. Um, if you look at the profit pool, this is probably too much information now, but the good news is that the, the profit pool is in the high end. And again, so that's where we play. So we play where the margins are good, there's growth, 5% versus flat, and, the, and, the, and there's a, therefore a pretty large profit pool. Can't probably see this from there, but basically this just shows you that all the major brewers are trying to get into the high end game, either through making sure they have good import uh, brands. Look at Constellation. Over the years, has started as a wine company, Wine Spirits, but they they purchased they have they have uh, Modelo and Corona, which are doing incredibly well. We think about the Mexican imports in the U.S. are sort of ye yesterday's domestic brands. They're sort of feasting on the on the bodies of Miller Coors and, and, and Bud, and they're doing very very well. A lot of these guys, uh, ABI has bought about 12 craft brewers. Um, Miller Coors has bought about five or six. Everyone's trying to get into the high end of the game. That's where the growth is. That's where the profits are. And that makes it even more competitive. If you look at it, this is just another way to look at it. Don't worry, I'm not going to try to explain this, but you can see the category is pretty. It, it, there's some there's some big players. Think of it as ABI, Miller Coors together, about 70% of the category. Then you throw Heineken, Constellation. Now you're up to like 80. Now you're probably up to 85% of the category. Then you have 7,000 local brewers. So so as Boston Beer, our challenge is we're kind of in the middle. So we have these big guys with all these resources above us who could do whatever they want, and we have. That we really have thousands of, of competitors that are, that are you know, by market that, that brew really good beer and have tap rooms and create a really nice experience for consumers. So the question is, how do we compete in that environment? It's a tough one, but we're doing it, and I'll, I'll show you how. The consumer's changing a lot. Uh, these next three, few slides just show you, like, this is, you know, consumers are really um, seeking, you know, variety. They're seeking different types of beverages for different need states, different occasions, and based on the occasion, you know, it's, it's with dinner, it's with a friend, it's in a party, it's home alone, wherever I'm, wherever I'm, I'm vibing in alcohol, I'm gonna have different choices. And you can see the average craft beer drinker drinks everything. So everybody's drinking everything. That's sort of the bottom line. So it's, it's, it's really, it's a, it's, um, it's a bit of a shit show, actually. So to, 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 excuse my French, but worst things have been said publicly. But you can see like we're fighting for, we're fighting for share with everybody. And it really depends on the occasion People have different desires for different occasions. There's, there are a few sort of key macro consumer trends that are impacting, I'd say certainly our space, the beer space, the alcoholic beverage space, but I would argue having been at Pepsi and Pete's and other places, it's, it's really all beverages, all food, are all facing these same challenges. And some of them are pretty, um, you know, they're pretty straightforward, you know it, health and wellness as a status symbol, it absolutely is. People are eating healthier, drinking healthier. Um, and actually, you start to see the activity in the beer space. And in the alcoholic space, people haven't really been pushing better for you necessarily because by definition, you're drinking alcohol, which is a toxin. And so, but now we're seeing like with millennials, they want just the way they're going and, and eating good food, they want to, to, to drink alcoholic beverages that are better for them. Now, obviously, you know, fewer carbs and calories is one way to do it, but alcohol kombucha is a big idea, truly. Which is you know which is our hard sparkling uh, White Claw is a competing brand, all very you know low carbs, etc. So people are starting to drink alcoholic beverages and paying attention to health and wellness. And sometimes it's what it doesn't have, like calories, and sometimes it's what it does have. And you, there are some beers out there now. You're going to start to see a lot more beers that are really about think of it as Gatorade. It's, it's Gatorade type uh, benefits in beer. So it's you know um, there's a product called Sequench from from Dogfish Head, which actually is a really good brewer. And Sequench really is being adopted by runners because it's, it's sort of a sour beer. It's pretty refreshing, but it's got that salt and the, and the high electrolyte content for, for post-workout. So we're going to see more of this kind of beer with benefits. You can't really discuss it. Um, I'm learning all these things now as I go. The things I could say in soft drinks I cannot say with alcohol. So you can't overtly talk about beer with benefits, but there are ways around that and ways to signal that it does provide some sort of other benefit uh, other than the alcohol. Um, this next one is more about quality over quantity. I don't know if you can read that slide. I can't see it from here, but um, it's about, it basically means that, that people care about quality uh, first and foremost. They're, they're not, particularly in, in alcoholic beverages, people are not drinking as much as they were before. 
So basically, about one, one in four people say they're drinking fewer, uh, you know, they're drinking less alcohol than they did before. Millennials are really driving that. There's a lot of reasons why. One is health and wellness. One is social media. People do not want to be, you know, seen on social media out of control. People want control in their lives, right? We don't have a lot of people lack a lot of control in their lives today for many reasons. So there is kind of a, people taking a second look at how much alcohol they consume, but or what they might do is drink lower. Uh, lower um, ABV or alcohol by, by volume type beverages. So a typical beer would have 5% alcohol by volume. There's a lot of beers out there now that are in the four, you know, between four and five. So people might sit, they're called sessionable beers. So people might be drinking more lower alcohol or even Heineken next year is bringing their, their zero alcohol uh, brand from Europe to the US. We'll see if that sticks. So the, the landscape is transforming. People are drinking differently. Um, people looking for experiences. This is the whole tap room thing. So if you go to San Diego, I think in San Diego, about 40% of all beer that's sold in bars is sold by in tap rooms. So that, means, that means individual, you know, craft brewers selling their products, you know, putting, you know, putting up a, a bar or a pub or brew pub or just, you know, sell, you know, selling their beer with pretzels. It's taking over, and it's probably about 10% across the whole U.S. It's really based on the West Coast. Um, and, on the East, and on the East Coast as well, Boston and Miami, same thing. So a lot of local brewers here, you go to Wynwood, you see a lot of brewers in Wynwood, um, and they offer a great experience, and the brand is as is, is much about the experience um, as it is about the actual product itself. Um, lastly, this is just about marketing. I mean, basically, we can't, as, you know, marketers can't go after you know, different, demogra or different demographics or target people by demographics. A 32-year-old woman here could be very different than a 32-year-old woman here. Their attitudes, their beliefs, we saw it in the last, uh, the last election. Those people who understand attitude, how to market to attitudes and beliefs and, and tribes that are created around those things versus pure demographics will have a much better way to connect with, with consumers. So those are some of the macro trends. I'll tell you about Boston Beer. Okay, I already kind of hit this. We're, it's, a, it's a good industry for us. Um, we're in a good position. We're in the high end of beer, where the, where the margins are, where the growth is, where the profit is. It's a three-tier system, meaning we can't sell directly to you. We have to sell to a distributor, 400 of them across the U.S. in our case, who sells to a retailer, it could be Publix, who then sells to you. But it's, it's pretty much, and it varies a little, a little bit state by state, but it's pretty much uh, something that's been around since before Prohibition. So it's pretty stable. We know it's going to be there in the future. Um, you know, for, we have, and I'll show you, we have, what, what sets us apart, I believe, is that we have a balanced portfolio. So we're not, we're actually not long on beer. We're actually, more than half of our volume now is non-beer related uh, products. So that allows us to kind of you know, buoy ourselves from some of the, the craziness that goes on in the beer business now and all the variety seeking and the switching. Um, so this is our, this is our uh, mission. So this is our, our founder is Jim Cook. Jim started, by the way, there's a great podcast and uh, How I Built It that Jim Cook did. You should listen to that if you're interested in this stuff. If anyone listens to the How I Built It podcast, he's, he's tremendous. He tells the whole story. This is his mission. I keep telling Jim, this is not a mission. This is not why I get up in the morning. To actually, you know, it's good to see you know, high-term, long-term profitable growth by offering the highest quality products to the U.S. beer drinker, but I don't get up in the, in the morning and tell my wife, hey, I'm going to get up now and sell the highest quality products to the U.S. beer drinker. I'm thinking about the pursuit of better beer. And that's really what Jim was all about. It's about doing something with really high quality and really caring and a lot of passion and integrity and authenticity. And I think our mission really, I, I call it the pursuit of better, is what we're about. But technically, if we talk to Wall Street, that's our that is what we're trying to do. I think the good thing about being a part of Boston Beer, we're a public company, but we really run like a private company. Jim owns 30% of the shares, but 100% of the voting shares. So we only care about the long term. And I can tell you, and I've been on the board since 2005. That's how I kind of got connected to Boston Beer. And we had a really good run for a long time. And then in 2016 and 17, we were down, our revenues were down five, six, seven percent And instead of you know, a year ago, instead of kind of cutting costs, cutting people, we spent more money on, on brand building than we ever did in 2017. And we didn't, we, didn't, we didn't grow profits, but we actually started to get bring the business back. This year, we're growing both the top line, I said 14%, bottom line, a little it'll be less than that, um, but still pretty good. But if, so at the end of this year, we, our revenue will be about a billion, will be about a billion dollars. Uh, we'll be about the same as we were like three years ago. We're gonna make less money. And that's okay because Jim doesn't care. Because the point is we wouldn't even get back to a billion dollars and on this really great double-digit growth trend if we had not invested in, in, the, in the brands, even, when, even when, during the bad times. If you're a public company, 
truly a public company, you're not, you're not making those decisions. I was at Pepsi for many years. Was, that's not how big companies think. People are thinking about their jobs. They're thinking two to three year increments. That's how, that's how businesses are run in the world of public companies. It's different when it's a private company, like when I was at Pete's, uh, we had really good private equity investors in Boston Beer with Jim there. He doesn't care about the short-term profit impact. He wants to do the right thing for the long-term. And that's been very liberating uh, for the whole company to be able to, to think that way. Um, you know, we take, care of, we take care of our wholesalers. The wholesalers are really important because they, the, they are the link to, to the rest of the world. And you want them to really like you because they carry, so for example, our typical wholesaler will carry the Miller Coors portfolio, a lot of brands, you know, Miller brands, the Coors brands, Blue Moon, et cetera. They'll carry Heineken and Amstel. They'll carry Modelo and Corona, and they'll carry Boston Beer. And um, to get, you know, they have a lot, of, a lot of priorities. We need to service them better than anybody and understand their needs better. We have 1,500 employees, 700 working breweries, 800 sort of salaried. Of the 800, over half of them are in sales. So that's our commitment. It's so like sales and innovation are what, what drive us. And because we have such a great selling organization, we are able to get the attention of our wholesalers who give us a chance to get those in, the new products to the market. If, if they didn't like us, they wouldn't spend a lot of time with us. So it's an important thing. I'll talk about values really quickly. This is a, sort of our value statement. Just for some perspective, I'm not, I'm not going to go through it. But we have every new employee at Boston Beer comes to an orientation in Boston um, within like a few months of when they're hired. We do one a quarter. And Jim will stand in the room and for three, I've sat through this twice, by the way, three hours on this one slide. He would talk for three hours about what the values mean. I don't know any other company that would do that, whether it be the chairman, CEO, which would meet with every single new hire and talk about values. And to us, it's super important. And I think if you look at the secret sauce of, of Boston Beer, it's having an active founder who's a great brewer, who's great in innovation, it's having wonderful, wonderful values that enable us to attract great people. And it's in this wholesale relationship that allows us to get our ideas to market. That's what we have. And I think the, I, I highlighted in red, um, you know, we, we discussed the undiscussables. And that's kind of a unique thing for me. And I've been now, well, only, actually only four companies in my whole career. Um, but I've never heard this expressed this way. And basically discussing the undiscussable means that anybody in the organization could go to anybody else. It could be one le level above, it could be, five levels above and, and share with them whatever it is they believe is they want to share that has to do with the company's performance and how we can improve what we're doing. I spent last week in, at our brewery in Pennsylvania and between and Jim came with me, we split it up. Between the two of us we met with 400, actually all 400 hourly employees in Pennsylvania to allow them to basically tell us what we're doing wrong. And actually it's kind of, it's kind of, it's tough because <laughs> you try, you don't want to be defensive and and, uh, and it, it can get really, it's sort of like if anyone's been in a focus group or seen a focus group, it can get, it can be that pile on mentality where it just takes one person to go one direction and it gets really uh, interesting. But I think it's, I learned more last week than I've learned in the prior eight months I've been at the company. Because I understood immediately what are the issues that, that, that affect our, our people? What are we not doing well? What's the leadership not doing well? How do we, you know, what do we need, need to do to change? And I never would have got that if I had to go through layers in the company. We don't have that many, but still even one or two layers, getting that feedback is really valuable. Very few companies um, would, would do this, or so people get penalized for doing that. So again, um, that's, that's a hallmark of, of the culture of Boston Beer. So here's our growth trend over, you know, we were founded in 1984, we started shipping beer in 1985. You can see we've pretty much been on a pretty good curve. Occasionally we've had our dips, the category's flattened. It's been innovation actually that's helped turn the business. This past year, truly, uh, um, it's, you know, as I mentioned, it's a hard seltzer. It's, we thought it would do about four million cases. It did seven million cases this year. We could have done eight or nine if we ran out of capacity. So it's, it's about, so it's, that's, to translate that, it's about $125 million business out of a billion dollar business. And we just launched it two years ago. So it's significant. It speaks to the consumer trends toward health and wellness. It also speaks to the trends where consumers are taking, when I say consumers like millennials, it's called 25 to 35 are taking their non-alcoholic beverage consumption with them to, to alcohol. So they're drink, you're drinking LaCroix at work, after work you want to drink truly. And you start to see that, we're going to see that with kombucha, we're going to see that with other, other things, um, you know, potentially, potentially on the cold, uh, the cold coffee, uh, cold brew coffee front as well. So the good news is, if you look up here, see if I can do this, yeah. So these are the, these are the, these, this is where the growth is. So here, beer, like almost flat. The growth is in imports, so think Corona Modelo. 
It's in craft beer, but mostly mostly local craft beer, not the big guys. So Sierra Nevada, all these other guys not growing. It's the small ones. This is, FMB is flavored malt beverage. So think of hard tea, hard hard, um, hard seltzer would be in there. Cider. But we're, we're number one in craft beer, although Sam Adams Boston Lager is declining. That's a big challenge that we have is to get growth for that. We're number one in hard tea, number one in hard cider. We have 60 share there, and then number two there. So the good news is we've been lucky on innovation. We've actually been able to found a way to, um, to really bring, um, to enter these new categories and do exceedingly well. Uh, this is the leaky bucket. This is Jim's favorite slide. He's, I think he's shown it for now for 15 years. It's been relevant for that long. But basically, think of it this way. The bucket is the mass domestic beers. So again, I think Budweiser, Bud Light, you know, uh, Miller, Miller Light, um, Coors, Coors Light. These are brands that are all declining. Consumers are changing, looking for something different. And when they're looking for a light beer, they want something different. And it basically is being siphoned off into all these other sub-segments. The imports are taking it. The crafts are taking it. The ciders are taking it. And our goal is to grab as much of that leaky bucket as we can. And that's what's propelling our business. Um, this gives, show, gives you an example. If you look at this, this is over five years. So the total dollars in the category over five years is up 15%. That's not terrible. That's driven by, and that's not a compound annual growth rate. That's just over five years. So the CAGR would be a lot less than that. But it shows we're able to take price, but the volume is pretty almost flat. But here's the big thing. Look at the number of brands. So it's, only, it's actually the number of brands have almost doubled. So you have a category that's not growing and you have a lot more brands. So think about like from grocery store to wholesalers back to brewers, it's a big mess. There's a lot of different SKUs, a lot of different things out there. Everyone's jockeying for position and everyone's competing on top of each other. So it's a, it's a, it's a very challenging place to be in. There's no way you're gonna read this, but it just shows you basically of the top 25 brands, 21 of them are declining in their velocity, meaning how fast they move off of the shelf year to year, it's being replaced by all the small local brands. So the only brands that are really growing, Mick Ultra, which has done very well, Mick Ultra sort of positioned itself as a brand for active lifestyle. It's basically a glorified light beer, but they've done a wonderful job marketing this brand. Corona, done a great job marketing it. Modelo, done a great job marketing it. Those three, and then, then our Twisted Tea. But really, it's pretty remarkable that all these kind of legacy brands, if you will, that everybody in this room grew up drinking or seeing, they're all, they're all kind of going the wrong direction. Uh, so what are we doing? Our, our, our formula is pretty simple. It's like we just want to, we have a great CFO um, that on our team who joined a couple years ago. He's the, the first CFO I've ever worked with that really understands what it is to invest in the, in, in the business, and he's very aggressive. And so, we, you know, for example, last year we, we've, we found $30 million of savings in our breweries. We put that $30 million plus another $30 million into, into investing in our brand. So the idea is find the cost savings un, that are, unproductive, never people, like we don't do, we will not, we don't lay out people at, at Boston Beer. We're very careful how we hire though, so we're not in a position that we, ha we overextend ourselves. So we're not looking for people. We believe that actually people can help us find, they're the solution to cost, to high cost, because they can help us find cost savings, and they did help us find $30 million a year ago. So it's just a virtuous circle of finding the savings, investing in the brands, then growing the top line, getting leverage on the bottom line, then reinvesting in brands. It's, it's sort of, it is kind of, you know, business 101, it's hard to do, but once you get into that into that into that virtuous circle, it's actually really it's a great place to be, and we're basically just stepping into it right now. We kind of f we fell out of it, we fought our way back into it the last couple of years, and now we're hopefully next year we'll be fully into it. We've been lucky; we've had some great innovation. Uh, we can't rely on that every year. You need to have you need to grow your base business, and you need innovation. Innovation should be maybe if you're, it's a good year, 15 to 20 percent of your your incremental growth. It was over 100% for us this year. So that's not gonna happen every year. Uh, and uh, we have to go back and make sure that we're growing our base business. Um, here's the good news too for us is that we're starting to source from wines and spirits. So that's the battle that's, that's forming right now. Our biggest challenge is not so much how do we take share away from Budweiser, it's how do we take share away from wines and spirits. And we're able to, with, with, with ciders and with hard, hard sparkling water, we're able to actually find a way to, to overlap some of those occasions I talked about work for spirits as well as they do for hard sparkling. Um, so we're pretty confident about the future. We're, we're in a good position. We play in the high-end cate high categories. We have this balanced portfolio, which is really valuable to us as non-beer business. Again, that most that no other beer players have. And the beauty is really, if you're one of the big guys, if, so if you're ABI or Miller Coors, you're not gonna spend a lot of time uh, fighting you know, Twisted Tea or, or fighting in the cider space. In fact, they've all come out of cider. So if you look at the cider category, you know, we're a 60 share. The, ne the next, the number two player is like a, is a 10 share. 
and so and it's a local cider. So this 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 these these categories are, are perfect for us. It takes some money to invest to, to play there and to develop product. So the little guys, the little beer guys, can't play in that space. They have other things to to worry about, and it's not big enough for the big brewers to really pay too much attention to. So it's kind of like this blue ocean that we're swimming around in right now. Don't tell anybody that. Um, is allowing us to really grow the grow the business, grow the top line, and grow the bottom line, and then take that money and reinvest it back to try to grow our business. So, we feel pretty good. The big challenge for us is Boston Lager, which is the first beer that we ever produce. It's a great great amber lager. It's fantastic, but there's just so many choices out there. People like the brand; they res they respect it, but it's just not relevant to the next generation of consumers, and that's the challenge. How do we make it relevant? Because when people drink it, they really like it, but there are so many choices, and particularly in the world of IPAs, IPAs are everywhere now. They're very easy to brew. Um, it doesn't take as long to brew them. The hops can kind of you know, cover up some of the brewing mistakes. They're pretty good. People, it's, and it's, a, it's a style that people really like. So Boston Lager is really under attack from all these small IPAs. Um, I'm not gonna go through that. Let's go, let's go right to leadership so we get into questions. So just some, for me it's like really simple. I have this one quote, ironically from a Frenchman who, on leadership and, and business, they're not so good in business these days, but, um, I love this quote from Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, which basically means if the, the way to lead is to basically create a vision and give people the tools and the ability to actually get there. But it's not to micromanage, it's not to tell people what to do or how to do it, generally, but it's, it's to kind of point them in the right direction and get them excited about a, a, a grand vision. And that's, that's what I believe leadership is about. I think the best leaders I've ever worked with, that's how they, that's how they operate. Um, so there's really four things that I think are really important to being a great leader. One is like really s simple. It's like when you meet somebody, there's two things when you meet somebody that you try, when you shake someone's hand, what are you trying to determine? For me, it's like, is this, a, is this person competent? Meaning, do they care about what they do? do they, are they passionate about what they do? Do they care about doing a good job? And actually, if I was going to the brewery last week in Pennsylvania where I met two or 300 people, that's what I'm thinking when I meet people. Okay, are they competent? Um, I think it's kind of important because some people care a lot and other people don't care. You don't want people who don't care working with you because they're not going to help you succeed. So one is competence doesn't sound like a very glorious thing, but for me competence is a big, is a big deal. The second one is really it's trust. For me it's all about trust because that's the second thing you want to know when you meet somebody. Can I trust this person? And so I think if you have those two characteristics, you're competent and you're trustworthy, I think you can be very successful in whatever you do. I truly believe that. Um, if you don't, you're not, I don't think you're gonna be. So for me, it's pretty simple. It's competency, it's trust. The third one is really about courage. I think it's, and I think, you, so look around, right? Look around the world, imagine all the news headlines, you can't, because there've been so many in, in the last whatever. But think back the last couple of years, think about what's going, on, what's going on in Facebook, what's going on in government, what's going on in, in sports, you know, um, you know, there's, you know, you know, did Roger Goodell even, you know, did he did he deliver the right punishment to the, the, the Kansas City Chiefs running back whose name I forgot? Um, like all these, like people, pe pe people are challenged with making tough decisions and actually in a lot of times making a decision, by the way, it's easy to talk about, it's harder to do, but making a decision that's not necessarily in your personal interest, but it's in the, it's in the interest of the, of the, the, the whole, the entity, the, the business, the community, whatever it is. For some reason, people don't know how to do that. I don't know what's happened, but I think, you know, being courageous is a really hard thing, and maybe it's not as, as glorious as, I don't mean to be that, you know, it's not like going into battle, um, but it's about making, making principled decisions based on, on values. So I think, again, I think, I wanna be around people who are courageous. The last one for me is about humanity. It's like, and again, I, I learned it, because we spent, so I've been in this job for, for about nine months, Every time I talk about the pencil, our Pennsylvania brewery, brewery, which is our primary brewery, we put in uh, 60 or $70 million of capital this, uh, this past year, and it's not working well. <laughs> so we have, we have these, this new can line that is not working the way it should. It's not getting the efficiencies that it needs to get. And we put, for a lot of reasons, we put it in too late. We didn't train people properly. But I've spent all my time talking about capital, capital for next year, capital this year, canning lines, pasteurizer decks, uh, variety pack lines, all these things that we've done, and, and we talk about the equipment. When I was in PA last week, I realized it's, it's really, it's, we don't talk about the people at all. We just don't. And the reality is, I mean, I talked to some of these people who work on that new can line and said, okay, what, help me understand what happened. I should have asked this like three or four months ago. What happened with this can line? And it's amazing that what I learned from that 
and how we, would, we set people up to fail because we didn't train them. We actually probably bought the wrong equipment, which was different than our other can lines. So we had a whole new set of parts that we had to work with. We didn't train the maintenance guys. Um, it's, it's, if you can't be sensitive to, to the fact that everything gets done through people, then, you, then I think you lose as well. And I think we were really at the risk of really missing the boat in what was happening in Pennsylvania. When I was there, I found a lot of other issues that were all people and leadership related that, that we have to address. That if we don't address, we're never gonna get the can lines operating the way they need to. So in any event, that's it. I'll leave you with this, we're going to Q&A, but I'll leave you with this last quote, which I love this quote. Um, this is also about creating the future. Um, this is the Hemingway thing. I'm not gonna try to read it because I can't even read it, but you get the idea. The future starts today. Every, every decision you make today has an impact, this, no matter how small it is and what the future looks like. So with that, so I whizzed through kind of quickly, but I'd rather do like some Q&A is probably more interesting. So thank, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, so we'll take a few questions uh, shortly, but let, let me just start off, uh, Dave, by uh, uh, asking you about the transition from being a board member to the CEO of the company. And uh, that's something that doesn't uh, normally happen, um, but it's happening more often these days. That's right. Um, how do you uh, make that transition? What would you advise someone else who uh, would be in that position? Yeah, well, I think I'm, I was very, actually very lucky to have been on the board. So on the, on the one hand, when you're a board member, you really don't do anything of value. <laughs> I mean, you just don't. I shouldn't say that, because John sits on a lot of boards. But I, I feel like I didn't. <laughs> Thank you. And I think you see the world in a, kind of in a very pristine way, in a vacuum, without all the nuances and the complexities. And when you get in, it's like, wow, I had no idea how complex this challenge is. But for me, it's been, it's been a huge advantage, because I knew, I knew the whole leadership team. Obviously, I knew the founder, and it's really important that that we had a relationship, we had, we, we had trust between us. I knew the, I understood the industry well, and, well enough, and I, I knew the issues. So I could get in and just hit the ground running. But for me, most importantly, it was the people, and knowing the people and trusting the people, and then quickly going below, beneath the surface to, to learn more. So for me, I feel like you know, I've, I've accomplished a lot more, more quickly than anybody. If you came in from the outside not knowing the company, you go, there's all sorts of stuff you have to acclimate to. I understood the culture. So I knew how I could behave, and I knew how to communicate, more or less, and I knew, you know, how to get things done. I think it was, that part was invaluable, and mm -hmm. but it was a wake-up call because things, everything's always harder than it seems on the surface, and that's I learned that pretty quickly. I'm not sure I want to ask you another question, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, let me just ask you a little bit about innovation because yeah. obviously the track record has been good. You didn't really talk too much about the innovation process yeah. at Boston Beer. Are there some nuances to that that uh, increase the probabilities of success, and what are they? Yeah, you know, it's a really good question, and I wish I could answer it because I'm not quite sure I, I understand it yet. But it's uh, honestly, we go we, we we go very quickly. We don't really have the problem is we don't really have process. So I, I'm not a process person really. I'm a former marketer. Marketers don't believe in process, but. But uh, at least Pepsi marketers you, don't. You hit, but, you, um, you've hit me again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think, like, actually, it's the thing, for, the way we innovate is because we have, I think, because we have 400 sales folks out there, mm -hmm. and we're getting stuff back all the time, we're, 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 get, we're, getting, we're getting good insight on the consumer and on what's happening. So we're able, and then Jim is so good at taking an idea and, and, and pushing it forward that um, it's really done because we, it's actually fewer people. It's a weird thing, but it's like fewer people and fewer resources, but a b better sense of what's happening. I'd like to try to find a way to bottle a little bit of that, mm -hmm. so we can be more, so we can create it, you know, on a, on a regular basis. But I think people get inspired, and then everybody lines up around them because we love innovation. We know how important it is to, to be successful. So this year, you know, we have we have the four those four brands I talked about. This year, we're mm -hmm. launching three new trademarks, which is kind of nutty. And that's because we have great ideas. One's around, one's a kombucha. One is a product called 26.2, which is going after McUltra. It's this kind of beer with benefits. I'm not supposed to say that. We tell everybody that's what it is. And, um, <laughs> and um, the third one is actually a product called Wild Leaf Tea. So we have Twisted Tea, which it does incredibly well. But it's, it, but it's, got, a, it's got a fair amount of sugar in it, and we're concerned about that. So we have a, a sort of more sophisticated uh, hard tea with very little sugar for people who care about that. And, so, and that actually, and Jim, that one started in September, and we're launching it in February. So that was really quick, because Jim, he loved the idea, he got behind it, 
we have great product development people, we, we kind of we push it out really, really quickly. Okay, uh, let, let's open it up uh, to a few questions. Uh, uh, let's start at the back and then we'll, we'll work our way forward. Yes, the gentleman with the blue shirt, yeah, go ahead. Just wait for the mic if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Good evening, uh, oh, sorry, and uh, <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for coming. Um, uh, my question is regarding, if we can get a little more color on, um, on this really explosion in the number of brands, I mean, that was I mean, double, almost double the brands in five years, and is there some sort of catalyst really that, that led to that, that I mean, 10, 20 years ago it didn't happen, why today? Uh, I think you mentioned something about you know, consumer taste and, and et cetera, but you know, in an industry where, it, where it's so concentrated, I think, I think you said two brands, right, uh, with 70% of the market share, it seems so impenetrable for so long that to have all these little brands really come up and compete seems, uh, uh, seems improbable, you know, and they've, they've really done it. And how, and I guess as a follow-up, why haven't the bigger brands, uh, the ABIs and the, and the cores, been able to adapt and just, given their benefits of, of scale, uh, be able to crush these little brands back into, you know, into non-existent? Why have the little brands just been able to stick around and actually grow? Yeah, those are, two, that's a good, those are two good questions. I think the change started, I, I would say Jim started the change back in like in the mid 80s. It's been a long time coming, you saw that line, but that's, Really, he really, I mean, Anchor Steam existed out west, and I think Sierra Nevada was out there too, like in the early 80s. But Jim really kind of started this whole craft thing, and it picked up, it's picked up steam. What's happened is it's really accelerated over the last 10 years. So if there's 7,000 brewers now, I think there may be 1,500 10 years ago. And I think you have a whole new generation of consumers who are drinkers and they're also makers. So, there's, you, know, you know, millennials are really creative, and there's a lot of, there's a big, culture now of entrepreneurship and starting business. You see it in the coffee business. I see you see it in the beer business. So, and the barriers to entry are very low to get the equipment you need to brew beer. It's not that expensive. And once you're in, it's really hard to get out. So it's kind of like low barriers to entry, high barriers to exit. And in and a, and a generation that's really creatively minded and driven that cares about quality, cares about ingredients, cares about a backstory and authenticity. And so that's kind of really accelerated over the last five to seven years. Um, and now it's like, you know, now the, the, like the revolution that Jim created, now like we're being, you know, we're being swarmed by all these other, these, these beers. I think, to answer the second part of the question, like ABI and Miller Coors, ABI's bought about 12 craft uh, breweries. Um, and, they, and, and I think they've done it more just to, just so they could feel confident they've got something going on and maybe to create confusion, honestly. So if you have like Goose Island, if you have like Goose Island IPA is a Chicago business, really good beer, that they bought, now it's everywhere, now it's national. Um, they've tried to do it, um, Miller Coors has done it. I think the problem is consumers, they know, they kind of know the backstory. So you can't fool consumers and authenticity is really important. So if I think of it, like, in my mind to like simplify it, people are looking for, they're looking for health and wellness, they are. They're looking for functional benefits. They care about sustainability and where a product was made, how it was made, and they care about authenticity. I think once those, those uh, smaller crap uh, brands get bought up and subsumed by the big guys, some of the luster's gone. And a lot of times the founders leave. And when the founder's gone, I think it's a tough one. And we've done, we're, we're experimenting. We have Concrete Beach here in Miami, which makes, we're gonna try some beer afterward, makes great beer. It's kind of an experiment. We bought Concrete Beach in Miami, Coney Island in New York, and Angel City in LA. And they all make great beers. And the challenge is how do we, the beer business becomes so local, it's hard to bring these brands outside of their markets successfully. And here's one last example. Um, um, Constellation, you know, the Modelo and Corona guys have been really successful, and their, their stock has probably grown more than anybody's in the category. They bought a brand called Ballast Point. It's an IPA based in San Diego, and they were like rock stars in San Diego. They took Ballast Point out of San Diego, and they killed it. They killed it. So these things are very delicate. It's funny, these brands are delicate, and, and particularly in this category, they're very much tied to the local communities. And once they get out of their community, you can take Ballast Point, which is a great you know, IPA in San Diego. If I take it to Phoenix, there's gonna be a bunch of other IPAs in Phoenix where people are more inclined to drink those because they know that's the local brand. So it's, it's kind of, it's, it's a bit crazy. Um, let's go to uh, Peril of uh... Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I know nothing about this industry, so it was fascinating. I know this much more than you. 
<laughs> but um, so you need to tell me what hard seltzer is. Is that Pellegrino with vodka, or what is that? Oh yeah. So think of it. Think of it as Lacroix. Yeah. I have right. a real question you're, too, though. But you're very sophisticated. You think Pellegrino? I think Lacroix. Okay. But it's like it's think of it as Lacroix without with with five percent on average, like say called five percent alcohol. So it's like a hundred calories. Okay. One gram of sugar. <clears throat> All right. But my my other question was really, how do you balance? I looked at your PL just real quickly now. And and uh, I saw you spend twenty five percent on marketing and sales, about. Oh, what do we spend on marketing sales? and sales? Two hundred fifty million. Um, and no, how less, than, less than that. Okay, but yeah, but half of that. Maybe it was maybe it was all of SGA. I don't know. I I, did, yeah. I just looked at it now. But but how do you balance the capital equipment expenditures and the marketing expenditures? I I realize you just spent sixty million dollars on your brewery in Pennsylvania, yeah. which, uh, you know, is a big number relative to your your total revenues. Yeah, I mean, I think so, we. So you know. Well, the good news is we generate a lot of cash. So we generate probably 140, 150 million dollars of cash every year. We have zero debt, zero. Uh, we have a credit line, 150 million dollar credit line. And I think when it comes to capital, the approach has been only spend at the last minute that you have to in order to to, to install it and get it in place. We have other. We have we have other. We 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 produce probably about 85 percent of our beer in our facilities in Pennsylvania and Cincinnati. We have other brewers that we can go to during the peak period. So in the summertime, we're not we're not producing just for ourselves. We're, we're we have others that, that help us get there. So we try not to put in too much capital, just enough in order to to, to carry us through everything but our peak times, if you will. So, but we 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 would not hesitate though when it comes to pr production capital. We would not hesitate to to make investments for that. The problem is, I think our ability to execute. Honestly, it's like we've been running breweries now only for 10 years. We outsourced, contract, brewed everything. So only for 10 years that we've been doing it ourselves, we're still learning how to do it well. All right, another uh, question. Uh, let's uh, go to the gentleman with the uh, white shirt, uh, whom I know. <laughs> um, my question is um, about uh, cannabis-infused beer. I see yeah. a lot of that happening on the West Coast. Uh, do you see that in the future of Sam Adams? And along with that, how do you go about uh, deciding how diversified a company you want to be before, versus like staying with your core competency? Yeah. Uh, I mean, is that too far for Sam Adams? Or I mean, if you could talk about that. But. I, I, think, I, think it's, I think it's far enough away that we're not going to be a first mover there. So you know, there, there are, it's, it's, it's legal in Canada now, all the provinces. And um, some of the big players of all, like Miller, Miller Coors, um, um, Constellation all made big. Constellation made a four billion dollar bet on a company called Canopy, so they're all investing to try to experiment and learn in Canada. Then eventually in the U.S., where if things change, uh, eventually they will to come down here. For us, we're kind of we're not doing a lot there, and maybe we'll regret it later. Um, but we're just focusing on like what we do well, and we know this is an area. If we get involved, we're not we're gonna, we're going to be we may not even be a fast follower. We're just going to be a follower because we're not sure where it's going, and we don't want to get too caught up and distracted. In that in that space right now, can you can you just say a few words about um, the structure of the uh, wholesale and retail sector, and uh, consolidation or lack thereof in yeah. that sector, and how it's playing into the uh, proportion of the channel profits that the manufacturers yeah. can earn? You want to you want to be a beer wholesaler. I'll tell you that right now. Unfortunately, you have to be b born into it. So there's not much you can do other than if you're not born into it already. But it's hugely hugely profitable. Uh, because everything's regulated, so and you can't. There's a lot of things you can't do. Like in the soft drink industry, you're constantly incenting financially, uh, you know, the publics of the world to, to, you know, to to do promotions and features and everything and everything else. You're more limited in the beer business, so it's great. They don't have to discount the product the way they do in other categories. So they get full margin a lot of times. When when a wholesaler, and again, it varies a little. There's like four or five states that are different, but it's it's a really weird arcane system. But when a wholesaler has your, like when we sell through a wholesaler. They have that. They have that product forever. Like we cannot take it away from them without going to court and paying a lot of money to get our product back. So once you're in, once you're committed to a wholesaler, you're in. So that that's also that makes it a challenge from an M&A perspective. So if we want to buy a company that might have different wholesale uh, distribution, it makes it much harder for us to manage that business. It actually works against M&A, but it, it is a huge. The wholesale channel is hugely profitable. There is consolidation. There's a company called Reyes, um, which is one of our important partners, and they're all, they're all over the place, but they they have a lot of the West Coast. They're also the Coke bottler on the West Coast. They're starting to consolidate. There's there's a lot of the small guys are getting out because 
as the business gets more complicated, more SKUs. So you saw the brands doubled in the last five years. I'll show you that one slide from 6,500 to like 13,000 brands. The number of SKUs have gone probably four times, not two times, four times. So if you're a wholesaler, you have to manage all this inventory, the SKUs. It becomes really an operational logistical challenge. You have to be a really good operator. You need the systems, you need pre-sale, you need all sorts of, all sorts of tools to, to, to make really good money. And a lot of the smaller guys are starting to say, you know what, maybe I'm out of this game, I'm gonna sell and then go to, go to the beach. So, um, but the good news is it's pretty stable, it's there, it's pretty clear. We can't go straight to the consumer, we can't sell through Amazon. It is probably one category that Amazon won't be able to interrupt, I shouldn't say that out loud, because who knows, they'll figure it out. But they can't, Amazon cannot sell beer directly to a consumer unless it comes, they have to buy it from whatever wholesaler is in that geography that the consumer is in. We'll see how long that lasts. Yeah. Um, okay, let's uh, take a few more in the uh, blue shirt in the middle. Just wait for the mic if you could. Hi. Um, I think I bought a beer from Amazon last night at Whole Foods. Um, <laughs> oh, that works. It goes to Whole Foods. It's okay. Uh, but my question is more about uh, the structure of your business because yeah. you've noted sort of this proliferation of brands and then extreme proliferation of SKUs, and you have an organization that's set up in a, in a certain way, and how do you anticipate that changing to respond to this sort of new yeah. setup? I think, um, another good question, a lot of good questions here. I think a couple of ways, if you have to think about it. One, we have the sales force that, and so there's a, there's a survey every year that's done by an independent company called Tamron, and, and to, among wholesalers to rank the, so, the different brewers based on their selling capabilities. We've been number one eight out of 10 years, which is really good. The two years we weren't number one where we had really bad years of 16 and 17. So if you're not growing, you're not number, you can't be number one. Even if they love you, you're still not number one. So we have a great selling organization, but as we add more trademarks to, to our portfolio, so going from four to seven, beer and non-beer, it becomes a challenge to sell, you know, because you, you get like 30 minutes with the customer usually. So one, one consideration down the line where we have where we split up our sales organization, so we're selling beer versus non-beer as an example because I think that, that will ensure that the smaller brands get the attention that they need. That's w one area that we have to think about. I think also innovation, I think we need a more, we, we innovate really well, but it's kind of like, create, it's like through heroics is how we do it. I think we need to, provide, given how important innovation is gonna play going forward, we need to figure out how do we, uh, how do we innovate, don't lose the creativity, don't lose the speed, but do it, but to have, find a way to do it more, even more efficiently. And, and, and how do we structure in a way to do that? So that's another one. As a company, we're not a brand, we don't, we're not a portfolio company. We're, we've been a one brand Sam Adams company. So also it's looking at the marketing of the brand group. How do we manage a portfolio? How do we make all the trade-offs, resource trade-offs between those, those brands as well? From an operational perspective, we have the distribution. Um, it's more, we, you know, we have the brewing capability. I think we have to become better brewers and more efficient brewers because actually some, sometimes when I look at the numbers, it looks like when we outsource our brewing, those cases are cheaper than when we do it ourselves. That's a problem. <laughs> why, why have the capital? That's when it's a bad idea to, to invest the capital. Um, so we have, to, we have to become better brewers um, and more efficient brewers. But again, like for us, everything is about the quality of the product. It truly is. So we will spend whatever it takes. And here's a good example. New England IPA, I don't know if it's down here, but New, it's a, it's a, the New England style IPA is a different, it's kind of like a juicier, fruitier, less piney, IPA that's, that's, that's doing really well. We made that and I remember I sat in a meeting, we looked at the, the gross margins were like ridiculously bad. <laughs> and, and I was like, we can't do it. And Jim was like, wait a minute, we gotta talk about this. So like normally we wanna get our, our you know, we wanna be over 50 margin if we can. We're talking about 18. And so, and Jim's whole attitude is, you know what? It's a, I'm not gonna compromise on the, on the hops. And these are all hops from, from the Pac Northwest, which are really expensive. Uh, we're, we're not going to compromise any way. I'd rather find a way over time. I was supposed to put together a plan to get that margin from 18 to like 40 over time. But we're going to launch at 18. So it's margin diluted. Like where I've come from, the first, the first gate, the first gate, or the first discussion is what's the margin on this new product? Is it dilutive or is it accretive? You can't have everything that's dilutive. Um, that's an example where we don't, we're, we look at the, the long term and we're willing to take a hit in the short term to, to get there. So we have the uh, former CEO of uh, SAB Miller Latin America with us. Oh, that was, a, that was a, that was a yeah. 
So, Carl, uh, would you <laughs> like to <laughs> ask, the, ask was, the next was question? Thank you, hello, Dave. I'm looking forward to chatting afterwards. Hopefully, there's beer there for that. Um, Dave, thank you for your interesting talk. I, um, I think I came just in time to see this presentation before you change your name from Boston Beer Company to Boston Tea Company. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I have two questions for you, Dave. Uh, a hard one and an easy one. Okay. Which one would you like first? Give me the, give me the hard one. <laughs> I'm all in. Let's go. <laughs> the hard one is about, about the brand Sam, Sam, Sam Adams. Mm -hmm. um, I have, I've been watching your company for a long time, and I've been trying to figure out from over the years from the brand communication what is the positioning of Sam Adams? And I know you've got a, a background in marketing too. And I look at the challenge of having a brand like this, which is now extended into, I think, something like 45 variants. And I've been trying to figure out in my mind, yep. what would I do with a brand like this that is so many things? But so, so, so what? So a brand things. so many things. Oh, so many things, yes. And so many variants, yep. su such variety to yeah. it. How do you position it? What is the position? Do you have any ideas? I'm open to those ideas. <laughs> but I think, so I think it is, it is a tough one. Because I, I think, think of it, it's like, it is, um, you know, how does Coke, you know, position brand Coke? How does Pepsi position brand Pepsi? It's like, it's the, it's how did Pete's do Pete's coffee? It's the original, the original craft beer. And the way we position it now is instead of, we, we were trying to go after all these other craft beers. And we realized we can't compete with the, with the small craft beers because they all have a story and they're all local and they're all newer and more interesting by definition. So what we tried to do is turn it this year, we do, and I, I was gonna bring the work, I thought I would screw up the, uh, the video, but if you, go, if you can check out the work, we have I put Jim back on in front of the camera, and we're really talking about, the, we're going after large lot, the big lagers, so we're going after Miller, Bud, um, Heineken, Amstel, impo imported lagers as well, and really talking about ingredients we're missing the emotional element here, but we're talking about we use the, the, the best ingredients, the best hops from Howard, the Middle Fruit Howitau, Howitau Middle Fruit Hops, how we brew it, how we, how, what lagering means, you know, the, the recipe and the quality and the passion and the authenticity. So it's kind of like the original, to sum it up, I'd say sort of the original craft beer with the, high, you know, the highest quality ingredients. It's actually moved the needle a little bit, but it is not the emotional piece there. It actually, it's resonating with older drinkers who know the brand. It's not resonating with millennials. So that, that's the challenge, is really how do we get noticed again by millennials? When you have a great, great, great high, really high quality product, no corners are cut, we take, we basically, the line is inefficiently brewed since 1984. <laughs> so, so that's the idea. So that actually that's probably more the strategy statement, which is like we do everything the hard way. And maybe the best way to summarize is like the best things in life are, are, are hard, right? And so that's kind of what we're saying. It's a little bit obtuse, to some people, it's not resonating with younger consumers as well as we like, and that's our challenge. And the thing is, you want know it doesn't matter actually in the end. I'll tell you, it's down. I'll tell you this is down double digits this year. Boston Lager, we're up as a company, you know, you know, low teens. So the impact on the financials isn't great, but the impact on the psyche uh, and the and the morale is bad because that's the, it's a name on the door. So we have to find a way to stabilize it. And um, I think, but it starts with Boston Lager because we have, you can watch New England IPA, you can watch Sam 76 and other things that are doing pretty well actually. But unless lager is strong, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. What's the easy question? Uh, I, I should have started with I the easy one. I wish you luck with that because <laughs> our experience actually was that as soon as you got to five extensions to a brand, you started hitting the skid. So with 45, I, I wish you luck with that challenge. The easy question I have is, is about the, your valuation as a company because <laughs> By any means, the company is highly valued, by, by any reference. Oh, this is the easy your, question. Your P, ra your P <laughs> ratio is 32, your, 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 your EV to EBITDA is like 22. The deals in the industry get done between 15 and 18 or so, so you're much higher than that. What's, what are you telling investors today that gives them a reason to support that valuation? It's our, our charming good looks relative to the SAB people. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I would say, Actually, what, one word, growth. It's growth. The street rewards us for growth. So if you look at our stock price, and I admit that's, those are big numbers. You look, you look at our stock price, it's moved. If there's one metric that it moves with, it's, it's top line, actually top line growth, depletions. There's, there's so little growth in the category, particularly as you get to the bigger players. When they see, the, when they see double digit growth, they love it. And, and then we get rewarded for it, that's number one. Number two, 
I think um, maybe there's also, they're also thinking at some point Jim might want to sell the business. And so that's always out there. Um, and that actually helps us when things don't go well. It kind of, it, it's, there's like a floor. I think there's like a floor. Because I think it kind of starts to come back up. So okay, if it gets down here, this valuation, then maybe it's gonna, it's gonna, someone's gonna come in. But it won't, because Jim gonna, is only gonna sell it when he wants to sell it. He's not gonna sell it down there. I don't know if he's ever gonna sell it. But I think, no, I think it's really about growth. And they, they like the growth that, that, we, that we can deliver. And I think they also like that our portfolio is, is balanced now, the Boston Tea Company. Um, and that helps us too. So I think we're, they see us maybe being better positioned for, the, for the, where the consumer's going and, and able to move more quickly than these other brewers. By the way, great, all great companies, but you get so big, there's only, you can only move so quickly. And then you start playing a geographic portfolio strategy too. So I, my guess is ABI in, in, in North America, they're, they're, this is a profit pool. They're gonna protect profits at all costs. They're not gonna invest, in, they're not gonna take a lot of risk with the business for growth. Let's take uh, two more and then we'll uh, finish. So, gentlemen on the aisle. And then uh, I think uh, back there you had your hand up. Yeah, so we'll go to you next. I think you have a great challenge and, and a fascinating uh, product. I got the chance to sample it when I was in Boston last time at the convention center. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but the question is, or one of the questions is, when you take a look at your marketing budgets, on a product like you know, Sam Adams, do you segment it thinking we're gonna go after the millennials or we're gonna go after the baby boomers? And, or you basically say, we're gonna, we're gonna lose, I don't know, you know, let's say the Hispanic you know, group because of Corona and Modelo. How do you go about you know, establishing your strategy when it comes down to a specific establishing a brand? Like, yeah, I, mean, I think for Boston, for Boston Lager, we have to do both. <clears throat> because the reality is even our drinkers don't drink us very frequently. So it might be like three times a year. So I think there's a temptation to go after just sort of your non-drinkers um, because they're, they feel more incremental. But even getting our existing drinkers, which tend to be older, so call it more 35 plus, to drink us more frequently, there's, there's lots of upside there as well. So we're talking, so if you look at our media plans, we're talking to both. So we're probably going 25 to 45 in our buying. We need both. And actually, kind of, if you, if you mind, a personal question. I, I read your bio. It's fascinating. If there's a specific turning point in your career or decision that you had to make to make it to this level, what would it be? That's a good question. I would say, for me, it's really clear. <clears throat> you, know, you, you go through life looking for an an epiphany, and if, if I had one. And that was when I decided to leave Pep PepsiCo, and I realized mm -hmm. that I wanted to do something different, and I, was, and I, I also realized that uh, people and culture were the most important thing to me, and, and I had to be in a place where, that, where I felt simpatico. So I think it was me, because I walked away from a good, it was a good career at Pepsi, I didn't have to go. I'd been CMO a couple times, and I was, you know, but I, did, I was really unhappy, really unhappy, and then when I, Quit. My wife was like, the ha she, I never seen her happier. Not even the day she married me, um, <laughs> because because I think she'd known and she all along. I think so. I think sometimes I just took a decision. It was really hard because you know things can be really comfortable, right? And why you know why change if you're if things are good? And a lot of things were good. And I love the people there. I always I mean I always love them. But um, it was time. Sometimes you have to push yourself to say it's time and just, so I worked a smaller company since then. I haven't worked for a big corporate company. I would never do that. Not for me. Mm -hmm. um, last one. Uh, first, I'll make a quick statement. I have relatives from the Czech Republic and about 10 years ago, they tasted your beer. I said, taste my favorite American beer. And he said in Czech, <laughs> this is very good beer. And it's the taste. only beer that he liked <laughs> of all of them. Quick, the question that I have is, I find it amazing how Corona and Modelo are growing so much. Yeah. So obviously I don't know much about this industry. What do you attribute that growth to? Yeah, I think here's, I mean, I, I admire both those brands. Here's my thinking, my, f my theory about them is that you've got <clears throat> these, you know, again, not to beat up on Budweiser, and these are all really great brands, great companies, no question about it, but you have Budweiser, Miller, Coors, which have been, the, they were the go-to brands 
for people you know, entering the category. I think what's happened over time is that the Mexican imports have replaced those as sort of the go. They're sort of they're now the new, the, the new domestic American beers are these imports. I think I think the, the, the flavor profile, the, the drinkability, um, I think they've been marketed really, really well. I mean, Corona's done it. Corona hit hit a wall like back in the late '90s, and they came. I think this whole you know your you know find your beach idea for they they carved out a niche that was very. This is an example where actually marketing really works. They they carved they carved out their their space, and they owned it. And they reinforced it and they kept it consistent. Modelo, I love the Modelo advertising. I absolutely love it. It's inspirational. It's amazing. I see. I can't. I can't believe in 30 seconds they can tell these stories. But for them, it's really. I love it because it's, it's like it's the American dream, through the lens of, of the Hispanic community. And it's also a big kind of fu to to the powers that be. And I think that's really courageous. And I love that. And actually, they can get away with that, by the way. And and if you go back and look at the first one, I forget the name of the U.S. astronaut Gonzalez. You look at his story, you know, his dad was a migrant worker. The whole story that they tell is the story of the American dream that's so powerful to me that I think started in the Latin community, obviously because they're living it and they understood it, but it works in, you know, in all the little white bread parts of the country too because everybody believes in that, in that dream. And right now that dream is under threat, right? It's a question mark. It might be more attainable in China today than it is in the U.S., so I think I think they they're both I think they really hit on it really really well and I think those brands will continue to grow and they're going to take it from from the, those legacy legacy American domestic loggers. Dave, I want to thank you for really interesting and thoughtful answers to a series of pretty good and, and very good uh, challenging questions. Yeah. questions. Yep. So thanks a lot for joining yeah. us in uh, Miami. My thank pleasure. So thanks. Much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Well, yeah. <laughs> so there's beer. There is beer somewhere to be had. <laughs> now, I put a pitch in for Havana Lager, which is our local concrete beach brand that should be out there. So you should try that. All right. We just did a quick photo up here.